Welcome to Coast Hills. Uh, my name's Jason. I'm the lead pastor here at Coast Hills Church, and I'm excited to share the word with you. So if you want to go ahead and take your seat, we're going to get into um, our LIFE acronym. Pastor Chet has talked about um, the acronym of LIFE over the last several years, and as um, we've been talking about the L, um, was has been learning the word. And I was praying about and through as, you know, going through this transition. And one of the things the Lord really put on my heart is just the steadiness of the word that we have been taught and have learned. And, and really kind of taking a next step from learning the word, which we have and we will always continue to do, but also taking that word and kind of going forward. So um, we're going to add from life to lead humbly with love and truth. Lead humbly with love and truth. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning is this aspect of, yes, we have learned the word and we are learning. We're always learning the word, but we're also being called, I think, to lead. And so we're going to talk about that idea of leadership and leading as a Christian. If you don't think you're a leader, um, I've got some things to share with you. You're not going to get off the hook today. So um, don't think like, oh, I'm not in leadership. I, I'm, I'm, I got to buy. Nobody gets a buy because everybody is called to lead in different ways. We'll talk about that today. Also just want to make mention, yesterday we had the celebration of life for Robert Ming. And Robert is, was a faithful man and servant in our community, in our church. And um, as we talk about leadership today, I just can't tell you um, what an impact Robert's life has had in our church and in our community as the mayor of Laguna Niguel, as the man in the sound booth in the back, um, as just a smiling face that I would see at Salt Creek. Um, Robert has left such a legacy of his leadership and his love in the community, and I just feel like it's such a perfect kind of segue from hearing and being inspired and honestly feeling like such a loser because... <laughs> Robert was an amazing man and is. And so Susie and the kids, like we're so grateful um, to have shared him with you. And thank you, for, thank you for your time and life here that you've left and are leaving as part of our body. So we love you guys. Um, yes, thank you. So this morning, as we kind of talk about this idea of pursuing a real and right relationship with God and others, that, that mission that we have that we've referenced to, um, just a quick question. How many of you guys saw Saddleback this week and thought real and right relationship with God? Anybody? Anybody see like, oh, Saddleback, there it is. Two peaks, one mountain, pursuing that real and right relationship with God. Anybody notice the street you turned on? Anybody? Like, pursuit. We literally are on pursuit. We're on the street of pursuit. I think that's such a perfect picture of the pursuit that God has for us and the pursuit that we want to return to him as far as that life that he has for us. And so as we talk about the life, we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, this, the L, the I, the F, and the E. And this morning we're starting with lead. So lead humbly with love and truth. And I've got a phrase or a sentence to kind of give some definition and expand out that idea as we talk about it. And it's, uh, it's this, we hear a call, see a need, or have an opportunity, and by faith, we step up to serve the Lord and bring the love of Christ and the truth of God's word in the power of his spirit. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning, this idea. We hear a call. God speaks, you know, that's so current for us as Chet, Pastor Chet has heard that call to South Bay. I have heard a call to come here and to serve and to lead and to love and so blessed. Um, just a quick caveat, I still am the principal at Calvary Chapel High School, so I'm definitely doing some juggling. But that call of God that we hear at different times to do different things. Maybe you see a need. It's like, yeah, you're aware of like this person needs some help or, you know, this neighbor needs a, a, a friend. Um, whatever it is, you see it. You, you know it. 
Or you just come upon an opportunity. You think to yourself, wow, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to help, or this is an opportunity um, to bring along um, something that someone needs, right? We see different things throughout the time, but really what this takes is ears open, eyes open. Scripture talks about being awake and noticing what's going on around us so that by faith, because of our trust in Christ and the purpose of God, that we step up to serve. And it really is a step up when you choose to serve. Sometimes you can step in something that you don't want to step in, right? You get involved in something. But when you step up to serve, it really is a step up. It's really a powerful opportunity. I love talking about leadership because I believe that things rise and fall on leadership. I believe that leadership truths actually are biblical truths. The the truth of leading is actually found in scripture. So if you're a business leader or you're a leader in your home or you're a leader at school or wherever you happen to be, I believe these truths are powerful. I believe that lives change because of leadership. If you've ever had a great boss or, 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 or an amazing coach or, you know, you've been involved in some team um, at work and you're like, wow, this is so great. Usually it has something to do with the leader. Or if you've ever thought like, this is horrible, <laughs> uh, it probably has to do with the leader as well, right? So the idea of leadership, I think, can and will and should and could impact our whole community, looking at these ideas. So now I said before, you may not see yourself as a leader. You're like, I'm not really a leader. I'm more of a follower. Uh, Or I may not be in a leadership position. But what we're going to talk about today is that no matter what position you find yourself, no matter where you are, you have an opportunity to be a leader. Because what we're going to talk about is that leadership is influence. And we all have influence in different places. As we follow Christ, we're called to influence. So being a leader is having influence, and being a Christian leader means bringing the influence of Christ. That's a a big difference between a leader, just regular leader, and a leader that's a Christian. Our mission, our purpose, we're going to talk about this, we'll we'll kind of build it out, but ultimately the influence that I want to bring is not mine, it's His. It's the influence of Christ. And I have a scripture that I want to share with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 says this. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. You see, we are called to be the fragrance of Christ, the smell of Christ. What does Christ smell like? Right, that can become the that can become the the question. Like, I don't know about you, my my son played football. If you've ever had football gear in the back of your car, it is not a pleasant smell, right? Uh, maybe lacrosse. You have I've heard ballet. Actually, I've heard ballet slippers are horribly stinky as well. I don't know. I have three boys, so I don't know anything about that. But the reality is, is there's times where a smell comes in, and you can't escape it. The hope is the fragrance is sweet, right? Sometimes my wife will like put some lotion on or something and, and walk by and I'm just like, oh, that smells amazing. That smells so good. So much better than the football gloves. So do you bring the fragrance of Christ is the question. And you may ask like, well, what is, what's Jesus really smell like? Have you ever smelled a good fruit? What is your favorite fruit smell this is not rhetorical what is their favorite fruit smell just give me one anybody strawberries yes what else guava oh that's a good one what else peach orange yes you know how you like get, get, you have some fresh fruit in your kitchen and it just like permeates right you like crack open the orange I think that's one, like one of those things that just like psh, and you just smell like what is that That's the hope for us. That's the hope for us that you come into the room and it's like, wow, what is that? Well, 
fruit of the Spirit. Let's talk about that real quick. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is the smell of Christ that I want to encourage you in. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the smell that we want to bring. The smell of joy, the smell of love, the smell of long-suffering, the smell of kindness. Like, that's the smell the world desires. That's the smell that we enjoy, right? When someone comes in the room, that's what we want to bring, the fragrance of Christ, the fruits of the Spirit. The second point that I want to talk to you about this morning about being a leader is, we kind of referenced this earlier, Christian leaders serve the Lord and help others. I really want to just dial down on this idea that you serve the Lord and help others. Leaders help God get people where he wants them to be and couldn't get on their own. It is not where I want them to be. It is not my mission or my purpose. It's not my plan that I'm trying to get across. It is the Lord's. I serve the Lord. Leaders lead so that God is glorified and people are helped. Leaders lead so God is glorified and people are helped. God may call you. God may show you a need. God may give you an opportunity. And by faith, you have to choose to step up to serve him. But in serving him, you will lead and help others. So here's a couple, couple examples for you. First one, Noah. Noah hears a call. He steps up to serve the Lord. And he builds a, anybody? Ark. Big boat, right? He builds this big ark. And what does he do? He helps his family survive. And ultimately, the human race, right? So... God calls Noah. Noah hears the call, responds, steps up. He's serving the Lord. It's God's plan, but it's the people's help. Nehemiah, he sees a need. He steps up to serve the Lord, and he builds a, anybody, Sunday school? Wall. Yeah, he builds a wall. Nehemiah sees like there's this need. They don't have a wall in Jerusalem. It's, it's broken down. They need to be protected. They need to be safe. And so he builds the wall and he helps the people in the city to be safe and to survive. Paul, in the New Testament, over and over, you see opportunity after opportunity. Any situation, Paul sees as an opportunity to share the gospel, right? And so Paul shares the gospel. He's serving the Lord. And sharing the gospel, helping people have a real and right relationship with God. That's what Paul is doing. And so he's not serving people. He's serving the Lord. Galatians 1.10, Paul would actually say this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. He says, for if I still pleased men, implying that at one time that's what he was. If I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I can't get caught up in just serving men, else I won't be a true servant of Christ. And what what happens easily is I get caught up in the, the purpose, the mission, what has to be done, the people, and I and I get focused on that and I forget that really I'm serving the Lord. I'm called by God. I saw God's purpose. I saw the need that God called me to. So the problem is, if I get off course, what happens often is God is not really glorified. And people may not even actually be helped eternally if I'm just coming in to solve problems. We're prone to burnout because the needs never end. If I'm just filling needs the needs will never end, right? Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. (laughs) Um, If I'm just serving people, I'm tempted to compromise to fulfill the mission. I, I, I only focus on the mission like this has to be done. I have to do this. 
And so I'm going to cheat or I'm going to lie or I'm, I'm, I'm going to like kind of divert something. It's like, no, that's, that's not going to fulfill God's mission, even though you think it's going to fulfill your mission. Now, I know that there's times like, you know, you smuggled the Bible illegally into China or something. We're not talking about that, right? We're talking about like, well, I've got to feed these people, so I'm going to go shoplift at Ralph's. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't connect, right? That's not the, the purpose and plan of God. We're also given to disappointment. If I'm just focused on people, I'm just going to tell you, like, it's not going to go according to your plan all the time. So you're going to set yourself up for being disappointed if you're just focused on the people. Man, I've served my kids so faithfully for my whole life, so I'm sure when they become teenagers, they'll really love and appreciate me greatly. You know, right? Like, oh man, I've given my time every Sunday morning to this junior high group and I sacrifice and I prepare and I pray and they are rude and obnoxious. Like, that's, that is, that's junior high. I spent 10 great years in junior high. I just kept flunking. <laughs> just kidding. So that, that's a reality if I'm just focused on the people or my purpose, I serve the Lord. I, I am moving according to his bidding. So I see a need, what do I do? I pray. I see an opportunity, what do I do? I, I, I seek the Lord and step up by faith. So the, problem, the other problem with that, when, I, when it becomes my mission or my purpose, the other problem is, is that I can use my influence Instead of the Spirit of God, it's my influence, it's my power, it's, it's what I want, right? That's, that can easily get us off. That's why people say, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely, because it's so easy to like, well, now that I'm the boss, now that I'm in charge, now that I'm calling the shots, it's easy to do. And I'm going to give you a whole range just a range of, I'm just going to throw out some ideas and look to see which one hits you, all right? <laughs> Maybe you're the older sibling. You're always going to be the older sibling, right? I'm the oldest. I'm always the oldest. My sister's always the youngest. That's just how it is. I could easily and did try at different points in my life to use that influence for my own benefit, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe you're the babysitter in the family. You're like, well, now that I'm mom and dad are gone now, I'm in charge, Maybe uh, you're the room mom at school. You're like, you know that teacher. Finally, I'm gonna, have, I'm running this party the way I want to run this party. We're gonna have whatever. Or maybe you are the teacher. Like now that I have my own classroom, I'm gonna, it's gonna be how I want it. I've seen that. <laughs> uh, maybe you're the coach on the court. You're the team leader on the sales floor. You're the CEO of the company. It doesn't matter anytime someone gives us power or we have influence, we're tempted to use it for ourselves if we're focused on our service, on our plan, right? That's, that's just, that's human nature. But that's not the biblical call. The biblical call is I want to use my influence for his glory and his purpose. And in that, I will help people, but I serve the Lord. So how do we want to serve the Lord? How, how is that going to happen? Lead, and if you have a good memory, we said humbly. You may think like, what about courageously, strong and courageous? Yes, that's true too, but humbly important aspect. Humility isn't weakness. It's not being a pushover. Humility really keeps us in the place we need to be. I have a quote for you. Humility will actually keep us in a position of spiritual power because it keeps us dependent on the Lord. As a Christian wanting to glorify God, I can't do it in my flesh. 
as good as you think you are, you're not God. And he will not be glorified unless it's his power. And humility is that honesty of who I am and who he is. Humility doesn't mean like, oh, I just don't think about myself at all. It means really I'm thinking about other people. I'm honest. I know who I am. I know my gifts. I know my abilities. I don't have to have false humility, but I also, I'm not making a big deal of myself. I'm making a big deal of him. So if you want to take your Bible and turn to Exodus, Exodus is the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, and we're going to look at the second chapter. So Exodus chapter 2. We're going to look at a great leader who needed a lesson in humility. He actually gave himself a lesson in humility. Do you ever give yourself a lesson on accident? because you do something stupid. Anybody? Anybody learn that way? It's so fun, right? You'll see. Moses, you're in good company. Moses, one of the greatest leaders in the biblical history, amazing man, has a, a great position. He has great power. He even has a call of God He has an amazing story how he's saved in the Nile and, you know, God's divine hand is on his life. Exodus chapter 2, we find, though, he fails his first major test. As a young man, he fails. And I'm just going to tell you, that's the tuition of life, (laughs) Failure, you're going to pay that cost at different times if you're doing anything. Young or old, failure is part of life, and hopefully it's part of growth. And so here's, here's the thing that I want, to, I, I want to talk about as you get to Exodus chapter 2. He had the position, he had the power, he even had the purpose, but he didn't have what he needed to have inside And this, I I think, is one of the great dangers and realities that you look around in our world, and and I'm telling you, it could be a a movie star, a a rock star, a, a, a pastor, a government official, like any person too young without something inside is going to be crushed. The weight of responsibility, the weight of opportunity, the weight of their influence, whatever it is, like, you can easily get crushed. Their character isn't developed enough to handle their calling, All right? Just think about, like, any child actor that you know. I challenge you to find one that's still successful, Right? A young person that becomes a rock star. How long do they last? Right? So many times. Uh, sadly, I've seen it in ministry as well. Oh, dynamic, gifted, purposeful, young, exciting. Doesn't have it inside enough to carry it. So here's, here's the idea. Um, every man and woman must be developed on the inside before they can be used to lead on the outside. Every man and woman must be developed on the inside before they can be used to lead on the outside. So here we find in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, now he's gotten older, It's not a kid anymore. That he went out to his brethren and he looked at their burdens. He saw a need, an opportunity. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. You know something bad is going to (laughs) happen. Anytime you, even in the movies, right? Like this way, that way you know something bad is going to happen. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm the principal still at Calvary Chapel High School, a bunch of students that are standing there. Anytime I see this, <laughs> I know something's up, right? That's just how it is, and that's what Moses does. He likes this way and that way. Something is going to happen not good. 
So when he saw no one, what does he choose to do? He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, so he thought that worked. Like, oh, problem, solution. Fight between, a, uh, you know, Egyptian and a Hebrew. I'll kill the Egyptian, bury him in the sand, solved. Nope. So we look this way. And that way, verse 13, and when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Disney. That's who made him a prince. Just kidding. Just see if you're paying attention. Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Uh-oh. So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And it was. Verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. He thought he solved the problem, but the way he solved the problem actually became a bigger problem. That happens, unfortunately. He didn't solve it in a way that would give God glory. God's call was on his life, but he wasn't able to carry it out. Look at verse 16 now. This is the interesting part. Here he is sitting down by a well, feeling pretty bad about himself, I am sure. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their flocks. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Verse 18, when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? So he knows it takes him a little while. He knows they have issues with the shepherds. Dad, tough love, I guess he's not helping them out. He's like, figure it out. So they water the flocks. They come back so soon. Why are you so soon? Listen to what they said in verse 19. And they said, an Egyptian, they didn't know who he was yet, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. You know what I think is interesting about this? what they called Moses. Not Egyptian, deliverer. You see, because Moses was a deliverer. That's who he, that's, that was the calling and purpose of his life. Moses sees two guys fighting and he's like, I'm going to deliver the Hebrew. And he does it the wrong way and causes a problem. Then he sees again, these women at the well. I'm going to deliver them from the shepherds. He does it the right way, drives them off, helps them water. He's learned his first lesson. It would take him another 40 years, but God is patient, (laughs) and there's waiting, and in the waiting, there is working. God is at work. But that's who Moses is. That's, that is the amazing thing about God, is the gift and calling of God are irrevocable. Somebody talked to me um, er, earlier this morning, and, you know, they were talking about, you know, like, oh, I, I appreciate your message. It's like teaching. You're, you're, you know, you can tell you're a teacher. You, that's who I am. I, I love to teach. You have a purpose and a calling You are created for something. You may be created to to help kids. You just love to help kids. You may be created to fix cars. You just love to fix things. You may be created to build relationships. You just love talking and building relationships. I'm not sure what it is, but I can tell you that God has created you with a purpose. And as you get older and as you grow, and use gifts and callings productively and, and outwardly, you'll begin to discover. Like, yeah, oh, try this. And this morning, I went, um, I went for a walk before and during worship. I walked through Kid Life. Do you know who runs Kid Life? Almost, almost runs. Not, like, there are adult leaders. But most of Kid Life are high schoolers. They're high schoolers. They go in there and they serve and they help the kids and they are doing an amazing job. That's awesome. But there's a lot of adults here. 
the Kid Helping Kid Life or Camp at Coast or in the sound booth or doing different things. Like there's a great opportunity to serve the body in church and there's a great opportunity to serve outside of church. Right, just taking those opportunities to bring the fragrance of Christ. So walking in humility, when we talk about lead humbly, Moses took his influence and his power and used it the way he thought it should be used. Walking in humility means waiting because gifts need to be practiced and a calling needs character in order to bring God glory. Gifts need to be practiced, and a calling needs character in order to bring God glory. And sometimes it's annoying to wait, but that's part of humility, is waiting and realizing it's not me, it's him. And sometimes it's them. Sometimes they're not ready. They're not ready for what you have. You wait on God's timing. Micah 6, 8 tells us, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord desires of you, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's part of his call for us. So God may give you a vision, God may have a purpose, but in humility, we wait. You know that, that's, that quote, I'm not sure what book it's actually from, but fools rush in, it's true. Don't rush in, wait and walk and let God give direction because our solution doesn't bring about his glory. He tried to kill and did an Egyptian to solve the problem. But that's not how God had it to be. That wasn't going to glorify God. The other thing that I want you to notice that's kind of interesting about practicing your gifts is that he didn't do the Egyptian Hebrew fight well, but he actually did do the watering of the well. Right? He helped the women well. Now, he could have been sitting there next to that well and thought, like, I'm the prince of Egypt. Too bad for these girls. They can't get their act together to water the flock. But he didn't see it as beneath him. There are times where we think to ourselves, like, here's a need, here's a thing, but it's beneath me. I remember when I was in Bible college, there was this guy, and he was, I mean, he, maybe 20, And he would tell people and talk about, like, I am meant for stadiums. I will be preaching the gospel to stadiums. And I was like, maybe, but not right now. (laughs) Not yet. It's going to, why don't you just share the gospel with a neighbor? That's a good start. Why don't you, you know, talk to the kid life people? Why Why don't you work with the second graders? Like, don't despise the small things, right? The prophet would say, don't despise the day of small things because small things are built into bigger things. That was something that was shared yesterday at the memorial service was how Robert would have the small goals. And those, those build to bigger, but you don't despise the small things, Because here's the idea, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you because I think it's a really important, an important idea for us. Don't despise the days of small things, or maybe just listen. Don't despise the days of small things that you think are below you because it is the small things that are below you today that when done faithfully, we build the foundation for the big things that he wants you to do later. You're like, oh, this is just little. Well, yeah, it's a brick. Well, this is like kind of below me. Yeah, it's going to be a foundation. Don't despise the small things because they will build your foundation for God to build greater things. That, that's the point. That's the purpose. So what... 
what God desires to do is to build, to build us up, to use us for his purpose. So when I solve problems on my own, think about this. When I solve problems on my own, I see two people fighting. I kill one of them, problem solved. God is not glorified. How about a couple other ones? Here's a few from the life of the disciples. Um, bunch of people, hungry, need some food. Uh, send them away and let them buy their own food, please. That's, what, that's the solution. And Jesus is like, nope, that's not what we're going to do. Why don't you see what you have and bring it to me and I'll bless it. And I will make it miraculous. Right? Uh, people reject Jesus as they're going through. People are rejecting Jesus. Their solution, should we call down fire and have it consume them? <laughs> Jesus is like, nope, actually I've come to save them. So no. Like that's not going to glorify God. Um, the disciples, they need an apostle. Judas has killed himself and they, they you know, feel like they need to complete the 12. So what are we going to do? Well, let's, let's make a list. Let's choose a few qualified guys. Let's have some sticks, pick a stick. There you go. <laughs> it, it's a solution, but it doesn't glorify God. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're seeking is the glory of God. So what glorifies God is what rightly reflects his character. What glorifies God is what rightly reflects his character. What is his character? It's merciful. It's truth. It's grace. It's kindness. It's passion. It's inside, not outside. Right? All of these things... That's what we're looking for. We're looking to rightly reflect the character of God so that when people see me and they see my solution or my interaction and they're like, wow, that person speaks the truth in love, that glorifies God because God speaks the truth in love. When God, when I step into a situation and I'm, and I'm gracious and I'm forgiving and I'm kind even though I could be harsh and mean and they have it coming and someone looks and they see how I solve that situation, they're going to say, wow, that's different. That glorifies God. Later, if I say, yeah, I'm, uh, they find out I'm a Christian, that's going to be a connection, not a disconnection, right? Have you ever like seen the way someone solved the problem and thought to yourself, yikes, and then later find that they're a Christian and you're like, Oh, that doesn't connect. It doesn't glorify God. Glorification of God is rightly reflecting his character. So we've talked about Christian leaders. We've talked about their influence. We've talked about how we serve the Lord to help others. We lead with humility. And we're going to finish with this idea. Love and truth is what we bring. We bring love and truth. Love first, truth second. See, love opens the door, and truth brings the freedom. It brings the light. But sometimes if all I have is a light, and I'm banging at the door, nobody's going to open it. It's like, who's the guy with the light outside? He's banging on our door. But if I, if I have cookies, and then knock on the door, they're like, oh, who's that with the cookies? And then I can bring the light. You see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I begin with love. So we're going to finish in this scripture. If you have your Bible, you can turn over. We're going to last place. We're going to talk about this idea of love and truth is John chapter 13. So John chapter 13, we talk about this idea of love and truth. I believe it's like one of the most important sections of Scripture for leaders and for servants. John chapter 13, verse 1. I'm going to kind of skip a few verses here and there. But John chapter 13, verse 1. The disciples have dirty feet. And Jesus has a lesson Dirty feet and a lesson. Chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. 
And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments. He took a towel and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So you notice in humility, even Christ himself was waiting. He knew his purpose and he knew his timing. Timing is key. And so he begins to wash their feet. Here's the thing I want you to see, should be up on the screen. He served them all because he loved them all. Betrayer and believer. Judas, it's already been put into Judas's heart by the devil himself, and yet he washes his feet. The rest, believing, following, seeking, and he washes their feet. If you think there's someone you can't serve, think again. Jesus served Judas. <laughs> That's an example. So he loved them to the end. And I want you, the other thing I want you to notice is he loved them in action. Love is an action, not just a feeling. To say, oh, I love you, but I don't do anything to demonstrate it, just leaves it mysterious. An action. Jesus washed their feet because that was their need. Now here, look at, skip down to verse 12. Now he's going to bring the truth. He loves them, and now he is going to teach them. Verse 12, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? They're probably like, yeah, you washed our feet. It's kind of awkward. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Look at this, verse 15, for I have given you an example He's like, I did this not just to clean your feet. I did it for an example. I want to show you something. What does he want? That you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, does he stop there? No. No. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You see, love is an action. Do them. I know them. Do you do them? I know this. I know this would bless this person. Do you do that? Or do you do that? He served them all because he loved them all. And then he shared the truth simply and honestly. He shared the truth simply and honestly. It wasn't a giant sermon it wasn't a big to-do. He's like, he, he loved them, and then he told them, listen, you see how I did that? I want you to do that to everybody else. That's where the power comes in. Sometimes we feel like, well, I'm just going to do this little act of service anonymously and, you know, just mysteriously. Sometimes that's okay, and other times you need to say why. I, I want you to know I did this because I love you. I, I want you to know I bought you the Starbucks because I really want you to have a great day. I want you to know I brought these cookies because Jesus is so sweet and I love Jesus and I want you to know Jesus. Like sometimes it's just a little bit of truth. And so I want to close with this idea, mission and vision. So there's a lot of talk, corporate world, right? Mission and vision, a lot of businesses and companies. But Jesus has a mission and we have a mission and a vision. So the mission is the, a work that's accomplished. And the vision is the plan that's fulfilled. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple. The mission, Moses, get out of Egypt. Get the nation out of Egypt. The vision, God, live in the promised land. Right, the mission for us, plant coffee trees. The vision, empower a community in Mexico right? The mission, serve in the parking lot ministry. The vision, make every person feel welcome and safe. 
mission, help out at Camp at Coast, or Kid Life, or Junior High, or the Sound Booth, or accounting, <laughs> right? Like, help out, or worship team. The vision, help people know Jesus. The mission, give out donuts and coffee. Vision, bless our community in the name of Christ. So for us, our mission is to pursue real and right relationships with God and others. That's our mission. That's what God is calling us to. He wants to have right relationship with people, and he wants those people to have right relationship with each other. And so we are pursuing that. Our vision is that God would be glorified, that God would be glorified as we reflect his character, as we serve him, as we seek the lost,